Oh, welcome. Welcome and, and good evening all. It looks like we have almost 35 people here with us this evening. Uh, we are so uh, happy to be here. My name is Sherry Ryan and I'm the Dean of the Mark School of Public and International Affairs. I would like to extend a very, very warm welcome to everyone who's joined us this evening. We're thrilled to be hosting the Lily and Nathan Ackerman Lecture Series on equality and justice. I would like to um, also extend a very warm thanks to the Engelman family, their generous support of this lecture series, uh, and for the support of the Lillian Nathan Ackerman faculty chair position. Uh, we have three members of the Engelman family here this evening. Um, we have Erwin, Roslyn, and Mary Ann. Uh, welcome uh, to, to all three of you, and thank you so, so much for uh, the gift, the generous gift that you've given the Mark School to support this important work. Um, Marianne this evening is going to offer her reflections on the spirit of her family's gift, uh, and, and um, we very much look forward to that. I'll say a couple words about Marianne first. She's an attorney and academic who's devoted her career to civil rights and environmental justice. Her experience includes 10 years as general counsel of New York Lawyers for the Public Interest, a nonprofit civil rights law firm, and she served as senior staff attorney at Earth Justice. More recently, she's directed environmental and climate justice cl uh, clinics at Vermont Law School and at Yale Law School where she was tapped to join the Biden administration. She currently serves as Principal Deputy Assistant Administrator at the US Environmental Protection Agency. She has lectured widely and taught graduate uh, law and undergraduate level courses. Her most recent writing focuses on civil rights enforcement in the environmental justice context and the role of lawyers in community-based movements for social change. Welcome, Marianne, and uh, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. That intro is longer than um, I'm probably going to speak, but I, I deeply appreciate it. Um, I bring deep appreciation from the Engelman family, which created this lecture series in honor of my grandparents. Um, thanks to uh, Mark School Dean, Sherry Ryan, Professor uh, Smith, the Ackerman Chair, and of course, our Ackerman lecturer, Professor Jessica Dawson. I'm very much looking forward to your remarks. Um, my pre appreciation to all of you who are taking time out uh, on this evening to join us. And a big thanks also to Diana Lazoff who made all this happen. Um, finally, while I'm here to welcome you on behalf of the Engelman family, and I will add that my sister Madeline, I think is on the phone. I also want to recognize the vision of my parents, Erwin and Rosalind Engelman, who made the Ackerman Lecture Series possible. My dad is a Baruch graduate. Uh, both of my parents are CUNY graduates, and we in the family owe so much to Baruch and to CUNY. The idea of this lecture series was to create a space where we grapple with issues of equality and justice. I'm joining you tonight in, in a personal capacity. I'm not speaking about or on behalf of the Environmental Protection Agency. Notably, this past February, President Biden signed Executive Order 14091, which calls on all agencies of the federal government to affirmatively advance civil rights by, among other things, considering opportunities to prevent and remedy discrimination by, and I quote, protecting the public from algorithmic discrimination. So many of us, seeing the executive order for the first time, asked, what the heck is algorithmic discrimination? The executive order further explains that the term algorithmic discrimination refers to instances when automated systems contribute to unjustified disparate treatment, uh, different treatment or impacts disfavoring people based on their actual or perceived race, color, ethnicity, sex, religion, age, national origin, limited English proficiency, disability, veteran status, genetic information, and any other classification uh, protected by law. Uh, this clearly is a topic within the ambit of the Ackerman Lecture Series. Um, but I immediately thought of my grandparents, Nathan and Lily Ackerman, particularly my grandmother, um, but for whom this lecture series is named, who came to this country from Poland and Ru Russia as a refuge. They had a hard life, 
and though their education was cut short, they felt it was the land of opportunity for their families, for their children and their children's children. Their children and grandchildren were everything to them, and they taught us the value of education and the practices of sacrifice, love, and care for the next generation. My grandmother was bold. It took a certain courage to travel across the ocean to this country, afraid of being turned back or having family members turned back at Ellis Island. In fact, she exercised this courage in many ways, including by trading in her more luxurious tickets for the trip to this country for steerage so that her cousins could also come to the United States. And yet my grandmother was also humble, in a way, and often deferred to my parents or even to us grandchildren as people who had education. I can hear her asking what algorithmic discrimination might mean and possibly throwing up her hands, throwing your head back, laughing and saying, my kind, you understand these things, you and your parents, because you are educated. Well, I mention this for two reasons. One, because it represents the value my grandparents placed in education. My grandmother looked up to people who were educated and very proud of my parents and then of her grandchildren because they received such a fine education. Second, that tonight's topic is new and maybe newfangled to some. Technology today is making our lives easier in some ways and more complex in others. And yet it's critical that we understand our changing world and analyze how these changes affect issues of equality and justice so that our policies can keep up with today's challenges. In that spirit, I look forward to tonight's lecture. And again, many thanks. Thank you so much, Marianne, for those remarks. Um, that is um, really wonderful to hear about your family's dedication to these topics and to education. It's very, very wonderful. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Rob Smith, who is currently serving as the Lily and Nathan Ackerman Chair at the Mark School. He's part of an emerging group of scholars practicing publicly engaged sociology, for Smith, this means identifying strategic sites of intervention and using cutting edge social science research to both understand processes at work that produce inequality and injustice at those sites, as well as to understand mechanisms for improving outcome at those sites. He is a principal investigator on the DACA Access Project, which is a long-term look at the effects of having or lacking and gaining or losing legal status on education, health, family dynamic, and interac interactions with the police. He served on the board of the educational and organizing nonprofit MASA for over 20 years. Thank you, uh, Professor Smith, and I'll turn it over to you to introduce our um, speaker for the evening. Thank you, Dean Ryan, I, I appreciate it. And, and I will also reiterate my um, a welcome and thanks to the Engelman family, um, to Madeline and Marion and Erwin and Rosalind, and to um, also echo uh, my firm agreement that the, tonight's lecture by Professor Jessica Dawson is firmly in the tradition of the Ackerman and intent of the Ackerman chair in seeking to understand and promote ways to promote equality and justice. Um, so, um, Professor Dawson's official bio uh, talks about the fact, it, it mentions, I'll read through this, that she's an associate professor and research scientist at the Army Cyber Institute at West Point. Uh, her research focuses on the intersection of social cohesion, narratives, and technology, and she focuses on the digital disruption of social processes. She authored Micro-Targeting as Information Warfare, um, and she co-authored with Dana Weinberg a really, really important piece that you can get free online at the Brookings Institution uh, about influence operations, narrative weaponization, the fracturing of American identity, which was one of the first pieces I read that helped explain our current political cyber moment of extreme polarization and also made suggestions about ways you might be able to not just understand it, but also fight it. And I was quite intrigued. And then I had the good luck to meet Jessica at the Eastern Sociological Society meeting. Uh, and then she put a paper in to a, a, an edited volume on the publicly engaged sociology uh, angle that I've been developing with others. And we've had, it's been a delightful thing to become friends with her this year. Um, and so I wanted to invite her, um, in addition to those things on her formal um, bio, 
I wanted to just to invite her here because um, I I really I like the fact that she has these insights about this key problem that faces society. And many of us are throwing our hands up that we have an echo chamber and what are we gonna do about it? And everyone that watches Fox News has one reality and people that watch MSNBC have a different reality, but she she's actually doing this work on the day to day. Um, and I think that's very important. I also wanted to invite her because she come, her story is different. She comes from uh, rural Maine and, and grew up with guns. And her day job is working as a professor at West Point. She's major Professor Dawson. She's not like most of the rest of us in North American academia um, in that way. I mean, she is like us in being trained and competent and smart and all that stuff, but she has other insights from things that I think many of, uh, of, of our uh, peers in the, in the academy, they wouldn't see things. And I, I was very, I, I have found our conversations to be very revealing that way. Um, I also, um, think it's really important for people inside the academy to be working with people outside the academy, like people that work at the Cyber Institute, people who are doing this work in the day to day, because part of uh, part of what this public sociology movement that I'm involved with, part of the idea here is to help universities keep their social contract, their promise with society by using the research to actually try to make society better. And I think that Professor Dawson's work does that. Um, and the final reason I wanted to invite uh, uh, Jess Dawson tonight is because we've had the most lovely nonlinear conversations that have been endlessly interesting and, in her words, would lead to five other papers besides the one that was produced. Um, and I, I think she's just really fascinating and, um, and insightful about our, our current political cyber moment of polarization. So please join me in welcoming uh, Major Jessica Dawson, the professor uh, and staffer at the Army Cyber Institute at West Point. Welcome, Jess, and I'm, I'm delighted to have you here. Thank you so much, Rob, for, for that introduction. And, and I just have to thank you for the opportunity to speak here tonight. And yes, those wonderful conversations over the last year that have gone all over the map um, and have really just been intellectually just very fulfilling. So I, I appreciate that. I appreciate our friendship and again, the, the opportunity to speak tonight. Um, and so I'm gonna endeavor to not army things up too much. Um, I've taken the profanity out of the title for the, for the audience, um, even though it is an academic term, we're not gonna talk about it tonight unless you want to afterwards. Um, but um, so we're gonna talk tonight about this, out, this question of algorithmic inequality. Um, the paper that, that, that um, came out of all of the conversations that Rob and I had was really trying to, to answer this question of, of what was going on in society. And when we really look, start looking at, you know, all of the polarization and all of the, you know, the, the rage that's going on, you, you know, why, what's changed, right? Well, for those of us that, that have been around the, plant, the, the sun a few times, right, maybe things haven't changed that much, right? There's always been people that have been, you know, completely, you know, very angry at the world. There's all, we've always had issues with, with you know, extremist groups and, and all of that, right? So these problems that we're seeing in the world right now are not new, but there's different things happening because of the algorithmic amplification of these things. So what I want to talk about tonight is really, um, first, standard disclaimers. I can get the slides to advance. Um, two disclaimers. So I am an army officer, so I need to put out the formal disclaimer that nothing in this presentation represents the official position of the United States Military Academy, the Department of Defense, Army, et cetera, et cetera. This is all my opinions um, and in and, and, and my academic research. And then I've got you know, some companies and stuff mentioned in here. These should not imply endorsement nor specific sort of, um, of, of avenues of attack per se. Um, just highlighting a lot of the problems that we're seeing in the, this ecosystem. Um, and I use slides to keep myself on track, right? So I don't use a lot of slides most of the time, but if I don't use slides, this will be a recreation of, of Robin Mind's conversations that'll sort of go all over the place. So we have an agenda um, and, you know, I'm opening with the, this picture uh, from, the, from the film 1984. And um, as we go through this, I think you'll, you'll understand why not only 1984 is an apt reference for the time that we're living in, but also um, why Brave New World is also relevant, right? Why Fahrenheit 451 is also relevant, why The Handmaid's Tale is also relevant. We're not going to talk about fiction, but fiction helps us understand the, the reality of the world that we're living in in a lot of ways. So before we dive in, um, I want you to think about fire. 
right? So fire, um, as as we know it, right, is is this 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 force. Um, it it trans fundamentally transformed human society, right? I think fire and the wheel are the two things that really you know transform human society and the written word. But it can be used to cook. It can be used to you know heat a bath. It can be used to sterilize equipment, right? And it can also be used to destroy everything, right? So as you're thinking about, as we go through this conversation about data tonight, um, we really have to think through the things that it can be used for good, but also how to restrain the things that can be used for harm. And that's really the challenge that we see in the current ecosystem and the regulatory environment is there's really no regulation at all, no way to require the, these, these powers in, in this data to be used for good and no way to restrain it from being used for, for evil as well. So as we think about these, these, these things, right? So one of the, the first things in the paper that, that comes up that, that Rob helped me um, you know, work through is this question of data profiteers and the algorithms, right? If you're not on social media, yay, good on you. You're probably, you know, you're missing out on a lot, but you're not missing out on a lot either, right? Um, you know, social media has enabled a lot of really good things, right? Is it, it has enabled, you know, the young gay kids that are in rural areas wondering, you know, if they're different, if they're okay, what's wrong with them to find other gay kids and realize that they're okay, right? That this is, this is normal and that they're fine. There's nothing wrong with them, right? It's enabled the Dungeons and Dragons kids to find the other Dungeons and Dragons kids and not, you know, be the only one in the library looking for those books, right? These are good things that have enabled people to find communities for their, their niche interests, right? It has enabled activists to build community and networks, right? Black Lives Matter came out of the ubiquitous evolution of social media, right? On the flip side of that same activism, right? And that same, you know, force for uniting people, it has also enabled incels, um, violent extremists, and, and a lot worse to also find community, to also find validation for their ideas. That's not so great. So how do we enable the one without, um, without constraining the other? Right? We haven't really dealt with this question effectively. We don't have a lot of norms around these, you know, this technology because it is so new, right? Um, so for everything that this, that this technology can do for good, right, it also has, has that dark side to it. Um, and it mobilizes and unites the other side of, of these issues in a lot of ways. Um, and the purpose, the reason behind this in a lot of ways is that these algorithms have not been built for people. They have not been built for society, right? They've been built for profit. Right, Facebook and Google sell ads. That's what they do. Right, they have they have no desire to do anything other than keep you on platform to sell ads. Right, that's going to have an impact on society, especially as you look through how they've designed their algorithms in a lot of ways. So one of the things that I always hear when we start having this conversation about the surveillance economy, right? So the surveillance economy is you know, broadly speaking, it is all of this data that is gathered about your your life. Um, from no matter what you're doing, right? So I traveled this week, right? I went to the airport. My easy pass tag was read by a, by a, a commercial company that has been contracted by the state of New York. My passport was, uh, or my passport would have been scanned by a commercial contractor contracted to the TSA. Um, my face would have been scanned at the port, you know, by a facial recognition company. If I signed up for clear, uh, you know, I've given them now biometric access to a commercial company. If I want my military discount online, um, I, you know, can go out and sign up for ID.me to verify that I am indeed a veteran and get that 10% discount. Um, so, you know, when you think about all of this data, right, um, if you're using a mental health app, right, is that data protected by HIPAA? Probably not. Um, anything that you have Googled, right, Google has a profile on you. It also has a profile where you can see what they categorize you as and what ad categories they put you in. Um, so the surveillance economy is not just, oh, don't use social media and you'll be fine. This information is gathered on you in just about every area of your life, and you have no control over what is gathered and collected. If you go to the hospital, if you've been to a hospital lately and you filled out the paperwork, you get a notice of privacy practices. It is not a consent form, right? The sociologist Mary Ebling has, has pointed out, you, you have no right to opt out of any, any data use of your medical data. It is a notification of their practices. It's not a consent form, right? And even if it was a consent form, if you refuse to consent, would they then refuse to treat you? So when you think about all of this data that's out there, I apologize for my dogs in the background. The family has not gotten them out of the house as I requested. Hang on a second. We'd be used to this with Zoom at this point, but you know. Moving on, um, you know, so you really don't have the ability to to opt out of, of, of this collection. 
And so you, we, we tend to, you know, Americans tend to be pretty, you know, individualistic, you know, you have control, you have a choice, blah, 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 right? We really don't. Even if you care about this information and care about trying to restrain what's collected on you, you really have very, very limited ability to, to, to restrict what's collected. Um, and the other piece too, is when we start looking at the app economy, right? So all of the apps on your phone, right? They're built on what's called software development kits, right? And so it's basically, it's pulling all of these tools off the shelf to build the app as opposed to building the code from scratch. Well, recently we found that some apps used by both the US Army and the CDC had, app, uh, had software embedded in it, had code embedded in it that was owned by a Russian company, right? Everybody's talking about the TikTok ban, right? And, and one of the common refrains there is that, well, Google and Facebook or Instagram, you know, collects the same amount of information that TikTok does. That's probably true. We don't actually know what the differences are. But the difference is, is that TikTok is owned by a Chinese company and that data is required by law should the Chinese Communist Party ask for it to be given to them, right? And that is a massive strategic advantage when you look at the training data that they're gathering through TikTok, right? So when we think about all of the data that's collected on you, right? That we're talking about your voice print, your face print, your biometrics, your eye, you know, your retina scans, all of this data is there forever. Right. And we don't actually know what's collected and we don't know what, you know, what's accurate, what's not. Um, it's a very, very black box, you know, situation that we're in. And it's in, in, in we know, you know, from from experience with looking at um, totalitarian regimes. Right. Lack of transparency leads to bad things. And so as we think through the, the way that algorithms are impacting everyday life, not just social media content, you know, we're really we really have to unpack the consequences of this. Um, so just as a little infographic, right, again, thinking through all of the data that's collected and owned about you, um, and again, that, that you have very little input on, right, um, where did you vote, you know, if, the, if you are interested, um, there's a voter transparency project out there that has posted the voter registration rolls of everyone in the country, if you're registered to vote and they've gotten your state's voter rolls, right, so if you don't want your address out on the internet and you're signing up for some of these companies to try to take that down, if you're a registered voter, it's still on this website and they have no obligation to take your information down. Um, but thinking about the app economy, right? So the vast majority of apps are made, are made by overseas companies. They're not made by American companies. Um, only about 7,000 app developers um, are in the US. The rest are overseas. So there's a good chance that the app on your phone has got either software development kits or other, other um, designers and, and, and pieces of it that are going to foreign entities, right? Well, so what? All this data is out there. Who cares, right? Well, it matters when we start thinking about, you know, things like the GDPR, the right to be forgotten. Um, and then who's going to do what with your data, right? We don't know what this data is going to be worth in the future. We don't know what it's going to be used to predict. So it's an incredibly, you know, dystopian viewpoint of the world when we start to really think about how our, our data selves, as Mary Ebling says, um, how our data selves, you know, control the outcomes for our actual selves. And, and that's a scary thought in a lot of ways. So when we think about this again, what can be known can be controlled, right? Your phone tells on you wherever you go, right? If you're in the mall, turn off your Bluetooth because the Bluetooth beacons are in stores to make sure that they can target you in the store, right? And oh, you say, who cares what clothes I buy or who cares what underwear I've purchased, right? Realistically, if it was just that one piece of data, probably nobody except the people that you bought, you know, the, 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 the sweatpants from. But if you've been paying attention in this space at all, Target found 26 items in all of their purchasing data. And this was almost 20 years ago they did this. They came up with 26 items that they said, if you have purchased this information, you're probably pregnant and or getting ready to have a kid, right? Well, okay, great. You want to sell me more diapers? Well, it's a little bit more nefarious than that because when we know that like as a major life transition, right, pregnancy and childbirth are major life transitions. And if you can hook someone during that major life transition, you've probably got them as a customer for life. Right. Again, is it that big of a deal that Target is seeking out and, and Target is not the only one. This is just sort of the major, you know, the, the touchstone kind of article in this space. Right. Target is not the only one that has done this. But when they're targeting people for 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 advertising and content at a known vulnerable point in their life, it changes the equation a little bit. Right. And I don't know that anybody has ever actually figured out what 26 items those that, that, that Target used. I don't know that we actually know that. Um, and that is, again, really, really interesting. The fact that, you know, out of all of the products that they sell, these 26 are associated with pregnancy. I'm actually kind of really curious, but so if anybody does know, I'd, I'd love to know about this. 
Um, but, but even then, right? What if you're pregnant and you miscarry, right? There's been articles about people that have been followed around the internet by their different milestones of the baby they never had, right? They've been followed around the internet for the marriage that never happened because they, the, the marriage was called off or the marriage ended, right? Um, this idea that you can never get away from this milestone, this past life that, that maybe never happened, right? There's no way to go in and tell Target or Walmart to stop surveilling you and stop sending you baby things because you had a, you know, a miscarriage. That's the kind of things that, that that's harmful, that's hurtful, right? Um, and it gets even more insidious in a lot of ways, right? So when we think about um, one of the things that Justin Sherman at Duke has pointed out is um, that data brokers were building what they called suckers lists. And these were lists of people that had cognitive issues, right? Had either Alzheimer's, dementia, some form of cognitive, cognitive decline or disability. And they were put on this list and sold to people who could would then target them with scams, with you know the 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 different types of you know Nigerian prints or you know pick your scam your email scam to you, you know list, right? That's horrible, right? That you're you're actively building a list of people that are vulnerable to to manipulation and selling it, knowing they're going to be targeted with scams and manipulation. Um, the medical stuff, we still have no idea where that, that field is going. That is still very much emerging. It is still a wide open, you know, range of, of problems that we haven't even, you know, really started to think through. Um, you can change your name, you can change your hair color, but you can't really change your biometrics. Um, and, and again, that gets really, really, you know, dystopian very quickly when we start thinking about, you, you know, the consequences of being able to identify someone, um, you know, genetically and not being able to hide, not being able to blend in. Um, not being able to pretend to be something else for your own safety. Um, these things get, it gets very, very dangerous very, very quickly. Um, and, and even religious relationships, right? There's been some reporting about, um, you know, churches, I'm gonna use that term very loosely, targeting people with the going through alcohol um, addiction for substance abuse treatment um, through, you know, porn addiction or infidelity, targeting them for, you know, to influence, try to bring them into the church. And if these churches were actually trying to help people and seek them out, and I'm sure some of them are, again, I don't think people would really be up in arms about this, but a lot of times these, these, these entities are, you know, seeking to get them in to turn them into, you know, tithers and make them turn over money and all of those things, right? There was just an FBI raid on a church of a couple of military installations for this exact reason. So this information that can be known about us, right? Again, we don't know what's known about us. We don't know what's out there on any of us. Um, and it's being used to shape the things that we see online. It's being used to shape the options that we have. Um, and it's being used for, you know, medical treatment and, and a wide range of things. And the thing about this stuff is, is that we really don't know how these algorithms work. That's what's absolutely baffling to me is that we're, everybody's celebrating chat GPT. We don't know how these algorithms work. We don't know why it's coming up with what it's coming up with. And that's a major, major problem. We start thinking about protected classes, you know, financial rules and regulations with discrimination, um, housing rules, medical rules, right? All of these things. If we can't explain why, you know, machine said yes, we probably should be really re rethinking how we're using it for decision making. Fun fact for those of you that don't know, we really have no fundamental right to privacy in the US and we have even less after the Dobbs decision last fall that fundamentally eroded um, you know, or overturned the idea that, we, that there was a right to privacy enumerated through substantive due process. So there's no organization out there that's tracking what's happening on these social media platforms. There's no organization that's regulating this space right now. Um, and researchers, right? So anybody in the world can go and buy this data, right? But if, if, as a researcher, um, is your IRB gonna let you buy this data? Maybe, maybe not, right? Um, so the only people that really can access this are the US government and, and, and researchers because ethics, right? Everybody else can. That's a huge problem. That is a huge information imbalance. There's no one that's able to check the data um, to, to try to uh, you know, figure out why these algorithms are working the way that they are. Um, it's a huge issue that really needs more academic power behind it in terms of, you know, pushing IRBs to say yes. And if IRBs are going to continue to say no, then we really need to be pushing for regulation for a lot of this data and the use of this data to be restricted and reined in. I was at a conference last week and, um, or two weeks ago, I don't know, time has lost all meaning. And, you know, this, this, this academic was really talking about how China is going to win the AI race. Great. Okay. Let's ask the Uyghurs how they feel about that. Um, because, you know, if you have no ethics in the systems that you're using, then what you can use it for is also not going to be limited as well. Um, so I've already brought up this idea of black boxes, right? So this is the thing that's really just, it, it's baffling to me. 
and you know bonus points if anybody can figure out why there's a dog meme on this slide. Um, so you know Wired has been doing some. There's been some just absolutely fantastic reporting out of Wired. Um, out of different organizations looking at the way that algorithms are impacting people's everyday lives right now. Um, and I've got the, the headline on here, the pain was unbearable. That is an article from Wired that is about um, this woman that was denied, not only just denied her medication, but kicked off of her insurance plan. And after, you know, series of, of investigations, you know, she was able to figure out that the algorithm that the, the insurance company was using thought she was doctor shopping. Why? because she had a prescription for an opioid at one, one pharmacy and there was a prescription under her name at another pharmacy. The other prescription was for her dog and there was no box to check in the pharmacy to say pet pr prescription. So the algorithm decided that she was doctor shopping. That's absolutely fascinating and horrifying in a lot of ways, right? Because the fact that you know this decision-making is going on, who's designing this that doesn't have pets, that doesn't think about, you know, hey, I gotta get my pet medication, right? Like that's a thing that pet owners know about, right? Are the people that are really designing these algorithms, they don't have pets, they don't have to deal with the consequences of these things. Um, so when we think through this black box problem set, right? Um, these things are being sold to school districts, to police forces, to hospitals, to insurance companies, to like, you name it, the, 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 the tech bros, for lack of a better term, are selling these, these magic boxes that will help you make better decisions. Better for who? Right? Who benefits when Medicare kicks elderly patients off Medicare or out of the hospital when they can't care for themselves yet? Who benefits when the insurance company says, I'm not going to give you your medication and oh, by the way, get lost because you have too many prescriptions? Right? Benefits to who? Right? That is one of the fundamental questions we have to be asking about any of these, these tools. And then the other piece underlying all of this we have to ask about is what training data was this trained on? There's a company that's trying to sell um, a, you know, an AI to help prevent school shootings. What data are they using to detect school shooters? Like, I really question what data, like I really wanna know what data are they using because that data set doesn't exist um, that helps give you all of that you know, background information on these kids to figure out which one's gonna be the one that's gonna go. That, that doesn't exist. And then if they're using it to try to detect weapons, Again, where is that training data coming from? Because if we don't query and, and challenge what training data these things are built on and really interrogate what's in them, we're going to continue to get junk products and it's going to have real ramifications for, for lots of people, aka all of us. The other side of this, and I think I've already mentioned, you know, is the data broker problem, right? So they sell lists of everything, right? So we've got a report coming out. We, we did a project with Duke. Um, and said, told Duke, you know, in, in their data privacy, uh, their Stanford School of, of Data Privacy Project, go buy data on the military. Tell us how much it costs and what you can get. Now, we haven't actually seen it because reasons. Um, but essentially, for about $7,000, they got $35,000 $35, veterans information. Um, you know, they got medication, they got medical, mental health status, they got family members, they got children in the home, they got age, they got religious affiliation, they got political affiliation, right, on, on 35,000 veterans. Cool. Who else has that data? Who else has bought that data? Because of the data brokers that they approached, less than half actually asked for any validation of who was buying this information. So they're just selling it to anybody willy-nilly. Now, the flip side of that is we don't know how good that list is. We don't know if it's actually legitimate or not. Um, but it's a, it, it's a real problem just on the face of it to think that you can go out, that anyone in the world can go buy a list of US military service members and then upload those to you know, Google, Facebook, and different ad platforms and start targeting messaging. That makes me uncomfortable. Um, it's, it's a really, really big problem, especially when we start thinking about you know, uh, people that are you know, in, in ex, um, you know, minority communities, right? There's been a lot of reporting about grinder and location data. Um, there's been priests that have been outed um, and kicked out of the church because of this. Um, you know, this has been, you know, this is, it, it's, it's not safe in a lot of ways. And yet the, this location data is still out there. It's still being sold. It's still be selling, you know, there's still data out there on, you know, sexual orientation um, and, you know, STD statuses, all of that is out there for purchase. Again, how good is it? That's a big question. There is some speculation that a lot of these data brokers are selling snake oil um, that that's, that's a problem in and of itself. So we don't really know, but in the interim, I think we should be erring on the side of caution of, we need to rein this stuff in very, very strongly to protect people, individuals, and agency, and to protect the American experiment called democracy. 
Um, so this is one of the things that I think is, is really, really fascinating when we really start looking at, you know, if you have no ethics, what can you do with this? Um, and again, there's been lots of focus on China and their, their data strategy. Um, but the, you know, the, they've collected a lot of gene, genetic information, right? What is preventing, you know, a Chinese company from, um, from purchasing 23andMe or any of the, or the other ones, I'm not sure which other ones are out there, right? And all of the folks that have done genetic testing kits, right? That data is in a commercial company. Someone else can buy it and then do whatever they want with it. You don't get the right to opt out of your data being sold if the company gets sold. Um, and, and we really need to think through, right? And, and America is not without its faults in this space, right? Like I'm, I'm not in any way, shape or, shape or form saying America is doing great in this space. But when we really start looking at the transnational repression that China is doing and using data and surveillance to engage in that, we should really take pause and, and, and think about the consequences of these surveillance tools that are being built and being used to oppress people worldwide right now. We should not sit back and go, that can't happen here. That is dangerously naive. Um, so this is just, I wanna just give a quick example of like, whoa, this is so hard to understand and what, how do you do this, right? Anyone with a credit card can open up a Google ad account. Anyone with a credit card can open up a, face, open up a Facebook advertising account. And then you can start putting in the different things that you wanna target people on, right? So if you know that there's an app that is used specifically by military spouses, because this exists, I found out about it last night and I'm thrilled as you can imagine. Um, you can put in that app and you can target people who have the app installed on their phone with whatever you want. Now there's some rules, you know, but how long will it take Facebook and Google, Google to catch you? Good question. Right. So, you know, I'm, I'm positioning this, this, you know, looking at this threat space from a targeting of the military perspective, but this is, this can be targeted on any aspect of, of, of any group, right. This can be targeted on documented status, right. People that are undocumented or have undocumented family members. This can be targeted on religious minorities. There's so many ways that this targeting can be used to disrupt people's lives and to, you know, pull individuals out of the crowd. That's another thing that I hear all the time is that, oh, you just, you know, you need to look like everyone else. You can hide in the data. No, you really can't. Um, you really can't hide in the data. Um, and I'll get to that in a hot second. But essentially, right, if you have an app installed on your phone, there's no way to opt out of the data collection that's happening, right? And, and so they're going to collect this information on you. Where does it go after that? Great question. Who actually reads the privacy policies and understands them? The other piece is even if you read the privacy policies and you accept them, right, you're really not, you don't have a meaningful option because most of these platforms say if you don't consent, you can't use them, right? Um, so that really becomes, you know, that's not meaningful consent. That's what Shrozana Zuboff calls um, consent washing. So just when you think it's, you know, it couldn't get any worse, it does. Um, you know, so as I said previously, it's not possible to hide in the data. You're not going to just be one blop of millions, right? So this is, uh, you can go and look this article up. It's out on, um, on the intercept. Uh, it's about this article of this company called Anomaly 6. I will just say that I do not think the capabilities in that, that they, they report on in this article are overstated at all. Um, they demonstrated that, you, you know, they drew a box around the NSA, they drew a box around the CIA headquarters, and they said, show me the, the phones of the people that have been in both, and you can follow those people home, right? Um, if, if Think about it from a protest perspective. Draw a box around a protest, follow all of the phones home that went to the protest. Now you have a pretty good idea of who was at the protest, and, you know, if you want to try to start tracking people down, right? It works great for, like, Charlottesville and stuff, and you want to get people that have committed actual crimes, cool, Right. But on the flip side, the, the right to redress our government is one of our five fundamental freedoms in the First Amendment. Protest is legal and it's encouraged. You might not like it, but, you know, the, the, how do we restrict one and, and, and save the other? Huge, huge issues here. So I want to frame this to end by framing this as, you know, this surveillance problem is absolutely a sociological problem. And I realize we have probably more than just sociologists in the room, and that's wonderful. Um, but this humanities and, so, and, and sociology in particular are really, really well positioned to tackle the deeper questions about this problem. You know, Hannah Arendt wrote about, you know, totalitarianism. And, you know, she could only imagine what we're dealing with now, right? The, the Russian, the, the Soviet government would, would have loved to be able to surveil society like, the, like the, the tech companies can right now, right? How does surveillance, you know, really, you know, reify these existing social inequalities that are already out there, you know, class, gender, education, all of these things. How does the surveillance and technology and algorithms making these things just that much harder to overcome? 
right? Um, we're getting rid of the SAT and the GRE, yay, because they're racially biased. Well, what replaces them? Have we really thought through what's gonna replace them? I don't think we have. Um, and I think that it's gonna probably make things worse in, in the long run in terms of you know, getting people opportunities from disadvantaged backgrounds. Um, you know, the consequences of our data cells, again, we, we know what's in our credit report. The credit companies have an obligation, at least in theory, to make sure that those are accurate and, and, and reliable. But what else do they have on us? How do we get, do we get to query that? Do we get to have any of that removed? Do we get to argue with any of the data that they have on us? We don't. Um, you know, and then, you know, just, you know, there's a lot of ways that, that, that sociology is uniquely positioned to, to, to and, and all of the subfields that come off of it to tackle this, right? But the sociology of knowledge and generative AI and chat GPT, which I haven't touched on, right? Again, training data. They basically went out and scraped everything on the internet, dumped it into a giant trash can and stirred. Well, most of the internet content is Nazis and porn. So that should tell you about what you're going to get as content out of these things, right? Like it's not, it, this is not knowledge generation. It's, it's, it's BS being, you know, placed into a trash can and stirred. Um, so I think we should really be interrogating a lot of these systems a lot more fundamentally um, in terms of what can it generate, what can it. I had one of my colleagues um, put my, my social inequality questions into chat GPT because I went to go to get an account and they asked for my phone number and I was like, yeah, hard pass. Um, and it gave me back garbage answers. They were well-written garbage, but they were garbage answers to the prompts that I asked my students, right? They, they were not anchored in anything that, that we were gonna talk about that semester. So, you know, we run the risk of, of dealing with, with, with students that are gonna, you know, garbage in, garbage out has always been the, the, the thing with data science. And now it's gonna probably get worse in the short term until we put some guardrails up around these systems. This is not something that just impacts other people. This is not going to be something that you're gonna be able to get away with. Um, you know, we, this, is an, this, is, this is by no means an exhaustive list, right? Um, Taylor Swift uses facial recognition at her concerts, right? Which company runs that? Where does that data go if you look at one of the kiosks, right? Um, a lawyer was just kicked out of a RockX concert because her firm was working on a lawsuit against the company. So they used facial recognition and pulled her out for no other reason than her, the firm that she worked for was, was, work, was on a lawsuit. Um, we've seen kids getting kicked out of skating rinks because facial recognition mismatched them, right? Think about the consequences for people getting pulled into policing efforts because facial recognition misidentifies them. Um, you know, this is going to impact all of us, each and every one of us. I walked around my neighborhood today and at least three times um, houses said, you are now being cam photographed. I'm like, really? I can't even walk in my neighborhood without being you know, announced to the world that my neighbors have cameras on their houses. Oh, by the way, if you have a ring camera on your house and the police decide to subpoena it, Amazon will turn it over whether you want them to or not. Um, you know, so this is not something that you can avoid. This is not something that you should not care about. Um, it is a big issue, right? But whatever area, research area that you're in, right? Start thinking through what data could be out there that you could use to, to both use to expand your research and to, um, you know, help tackle the data as well, right? These questions of data bias and, and design, what's missing in the data? You know, there's the classic example of, of women's heart attack symptoms looking very different from men, right? So if we look at medical data, we're going to see a gap in heart attack symptoms because the way that they're encoded um, looks for male symptoms, not female symptoms, right? I just logged into one of my, one of my doctor's portals and they have my men's health uh, status set up. I'm like, that's awesome, right? So like, is that just an error that they, you know, have me under a male profile or is that like the default and that everybody's you know gender stuff goes in the male bucket great question right but researchers like we need every we need all of the power of the academy behind this and unpacking this and digging into this um whatever your field is there's data out there go get it go buy it figure out how to get it it's not expensive that's the thing this stuff is not expensive sub ten thousand dollars will get you hundreds of data sets thousands of data sets um Qualitative researchers, for those of you in the room that are like cringing about the thought of data, no, no, we absolutely need you, right? We need you unpacking and helping understand what's there, what's missing, why is this here, why isn't this there? Um, we really need everybody, you know, in, in this fight, as it were, to protect the, you know, the, the consequences of society, right? I would also argue, you know, if you have an option, opt out of tech where, you know, surveillance wherever you can. If you're going to use a tool for your classroom, make sure it's one that doesn't do data collection. Um, you know, if you can opt out of apps and stuff on your own personal phones, you know, try. 
um, you know, but get involved um, and, and seek, you know, decryption by default always if you can, um, because this is, it's, this is not something that one person can tackle. This is not something that even a few of us can tackle. It's going to require normative change and, and regulatory change from, from all of us. And so with that, I'm gonna end with my favorite meme, the world is ending, you know, and as the gremlin, the smart gremlin in uh, Gremlins 2 said, we're advising everyone to put their uh, money into canned food and shotguns. So the world is ending and all is dark and bleak. Um, what are your questions? <laughs> I have a question. Uh, please, Rosalind, go ahead. Yes. I have noticed that younger and younger children, three, to five are on very sophisticated cell phones. They are answering questions, they are playing games, and they are developing lifelong habits of being addicted to cell phones. I think that all of the cautionary things that you suggested are important, but if children are being preyed upon, and the elderly are being preyed upon, but children particularly, how does one govern this uh, insidious kind of use of apps? Yeah, that is that is absolutely a great question, right? And and there's there's a lot of different angles to it, right? Like I was an absolutely perfect parent before I had children. Um, and I, I will never judge another parent for giving their kid, a, you know, an app to get five minutes of peace to be able to get to the grocery store without an incident or anything like that, right? So like, I can totally understand where exhausted and stressed out parents are like, I just need five minutes, right? But on the flip side, you're absolutely right that this technology is absolutely addictive. It is designed to be addictive. Um, if you haven't watched the, the Social Dilemma on Netflix, I highly recommend it. Um, you know, we have some rules about addictive things, you know, cigarettes, et cetera. Um, but this, there really needs to be restraints on how these systems are designed and, and developed to, to stop preying on people's addictions. Um, great. So um, I think we're in the question answer period now. The best way for us to move, I think, is for people to put their questions in the chat and I will read them off to Professor Dawson so that she doesn't have to toggle back and forth. While you guys are thinking of questions, I'm gonna take the chair prerogative and ask a first question or two to get things moving. But if you guys wanna please put your questions in the chat, we can, we can do that. Um, so I wanted to see if I could get you, uh, Professor Dawson, to follow up a bit on the um, policy recs and analysis you did in um, the piece about the, uh, the the Brookings Institution piece about changing uh, the meaning of, um, about targeting and the, changing the meaning of patriotism from defending the country to hating the government. Um, one of the things that I thought that was really useful there um, was the idea that you could control who could collect what? Who who you could collect data about? And one of the policy prescriptions was to prohibit these companies from collecting data on active duty military, from collecting their data and targeting them. Um, and then a second set of of recommendations, and I don't know if this has come out of things in your paper or that you've written or that you've spoken about, was the idea that um, you talked about it in the in the in the um, talk a little bit, but I want you to maybe develop it a little more. The idea that this data, the research, these these are all research companies. These data, these companies doing this algorithmic work, they're research companies, and the fact that they have a free pass on this when the 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 social media ecosystem they've created has not only. Um, amplified social divisions and undermined democratic institutions. It's it's driven them further and further apart. Why would they get a free pass in terms of this? So I, I wanted to get a little bit more of your thinking about what concrete kinds of steps we might take to regulate both the data that's collected, but also this calibration of algorithms, right? Algorithms are made by people, right? I know they learn and they do it themselves, but there should be, if, if you or I or anyone else here wanted to do that, we'd need to have an IRB approve this. One of the things you floated before was to have a panel of experts. So I put two or three questions out there. Um, so I'll check the other questions while you give some, some first answers. 
Yeah, so I think that's that is a fabulous and, and actually accurate point, right? If you haven't read about um, Frances Haugen's whistleblower testimony about Facebook, um, you know, one of the things that she testified about is that Facebook was doing, you know, doing research and, and conducting polls with people about with children, right? Children under the age of 14 um, about whether or not Instagram made their their mental health better or, or worse. And, you know, the vast majority of folks said, yeah, Instagram makes life better. But for about 11 percent of those teenagers, they said it made it worse. Well, what did Facebook do? Oh, it referred them to wellness experts. Well, if you've ever dealt with anyone that's dealing with self-harm, eating disorders, or, or suicidal ideation, they do not need a wellness expert. They need a doctor. So the fact that Facebook was conducting experiments, psychological experiments on our children, and no one really raised a red flag and went, whoa, 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 what? Um, like, time out a second. The, the A-B testing, all of that, like, those are experiments. Those are human subjects experience, experiments. You're, they absolutely should be regulated and controlled. These are massive psychological experiments that have been going on. And not everyone has the same ability to consent. Again, going back to people with, you know, cognitive decline issues and all of that, right? You can't consent to that. There's no controls on this. Um, and so, yes, this stuff absolutely needs to be more regulated. And they, they've, they've gotten away with it in a lot of ways because they've couched it as, oh, we're A-B testing, where we're finding the algorithm, we're changing things on the platform. And they've obscured the people that are behind it that are impacted by it. Um, you know, one of the things that, you know, for example, this, this was a story that was absolutely horrifying. Um, Amazon's algorithm were recommending the different products that you would need to kill yourself, right? Um, and, and these are products that are perfectly normal in other uses, right? So gardening products, et cetera. But because enough people had ordered them together, that if you started looking at one, they would recommend the other things. I have a friend who is alive today because Amazon wouldn't ship those products to an APO address when he was in Korea. He was looking to do that. Um, and the only thing that saved him was the fact that Amazon wouldn't ship to Korea. Great. Um, how many other people have died because people have figured out because Amazon's recommendation? And I don't think anybody at Amazon is going, ha, let's figure out how to do this, right? But they're not paying attention to it and they don't care and they're not required to, solve, to, to take these, the, the, to, to fix these algorithms when they are identified as harmful. Um, and then that's assuming they can figure out what it is that's triggered the algorithm recommendation anyway, right? Like that's the other piece of this. Um, so the, the other piece about the collection, right? So one of my good idea fairies is, you know, ha in California, if you are a California resident, you can go in and opt out of a lot of different things, right? Um, and there's no real verification, right? You could just say California resident and, you know, put in an address. I think if we were to do something along those lines for, for service members, right, of like, yep, I'm going to put in that I'm a military service member and you now have to take away all of my information, right? That would be good. The risk to that becomes if we have to verify that you're military in order to do that, well, then we've just validated that you're a military service member, right? And there's companies out there that are doing that that are a massive, massive national security risk because they're private companies um, and they don't have the, you know, not that, you know, they don't have any sort of extra, um, you know, protectors and lay layers about there to prevent them from being hacked. So again, not that the government has done a great job there in and of itself, but, you know, having companies like id.me gathering validated lists of military service members and their spouses and then being able to you know sell that data for advertising is a huge issue to me you're muted rob i'm muted so um we have a question from um reuben kaufman and i'm going to summarize um but Mr. Kaufman writes that um, when he talks about uh, the the trying to get make privacy an important thing again, his peers um, say, "Well, what do you have to hide?" Yeah, um, I hear that all the time. Yeah, it's what do you have to hide, and they already have everything, so why bother? Right? Those are the two constant refrains, and and and. You know, I, I would say that, you know, what do you have to hide when you become the character of the day because, you know, you get blasted on, on, you know, on Twitter and you become the main character and you start to see all of the stupid things and little things in your life that get taken out of proportion, taken out of context um, and, and, and get weaponized, right? Pictures of your kids, of your family members, um, you know, innocuous social media posts from a decade ago and your perspectives have changed. Um, we all have things that we want to hide, right? We all have things and boundaries. You know, there's a really great paper um, by George Zimmel on secrecy. And, you know, we there are boundaries of things that we share with some folks that we, we don't share with others, right? My medical information is between me and my doctor. I'm nothing to be ashamed of, but I really don't feel like talking about menopause with the rest of the room, right? 
like that's not a thing that you know maybe we should because we should destigmatize that but right but like there's 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 boundaries of things that we share with people zuckerberg famously said you know people shouldn't have different aspects of their life and it's like that's fundamentally a misunderstanding of how people are we don't share every aspect of our lives with everybody else um, so I, you know, I think that those types of perspectives have been fostered and 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 supported by the these companies. They want people to take a a laissez-faire approach um, because they gain from having that data out there. Um, and you know, those of us that are you know serious about it get looked like it like we're you know the the weirdos and and all of that. But I want to offer up hope. Um, there's a book, you know, Microtrend Square that said there will be a new Luddite movement of those of us that are going to push back against their surveillance and tech. So we need to, you know, find our people and, and build a movement, right? Use the social media to build the movement. <laughs> but no, I mean, it, you're right. That is a big issue. And that is a very common refrain. And, you know, that's where you've got to find ways to get people to think about it, right? This isn't just national, national, you know, figures that are getting, you know, targeted and attacked. You know, we have election workers that are leaving, be refusing to be election workers anymore because of the harassment that they're they're receiving. Um, we have people that are leaving school boards because of the harassment that they're receiving. Um, you know, we have kids who are having bomb threats called in on them because their parents have, you know, made an enemy online, right? So there's all kinds of things out there. It's not about what you have to hide. There's this wonderful quote by Chris Wiley. He says, if we are bound to, you know, and I'm going to, I'm going to misquote it, but, you know, if we are bound to who we were, our old beliefs, our old relationships and our old selves, we can never become who we're going to be. Um, you know, we, for, we, we, in, in a, in a society that is bound to, you know, data and, and perfect remembrance, we, we forget the value of forgetting. Um, we, we, we don't realize the, the things that are lost when you have perfect recall and perfect recollection. Um, and I just thought that, you know, his insights about agency, that privacy is fundamentally about agency, um, really, really struck me. And I, I think that's really the key. It's like, I, I want to be able to move on from my old beliefs, my old selves, my old relationships. I don't want to be followed around the internet by a miscarriage that I had 20 years ago. I don't want to be followed around the internet by an old relationship that ended badly that I never want to see this person again. And now Facebook keeps recommending them as you know, as a Facebook friend, right? Um, like this, th those are very simplistic ways of looking at it. And that's again, why it requires systemic level work because so many people, it's hard to opt out of this stuff. It's a pain in the neck. So we, it's gonna require systemic work to, to rein these companies in before their power becomes ubiquitous and we end up living in, an ex, in, you know, in an Elysium type environment. Thank you. Um, so we've got a bunch more questions here. Um, I'm going to run through. Uh, I'll I'll put a couple of them out. I'll put this one's different than some of the others are focused on the same uh, issue. And I'm going. This is a complicated question, so I'm going to read it directly. You focused on surveillance by the private sector for commercial purposes, but given the seeming convergence between government agencies and the private sector, how dangerous is government surveillance, e.g., echelon? to our society and democracy, and are different measures needed to combat Chinese style regimes? Yeah, that's a really, really great question. And I think, you know, we should always err on the side of less data, right? Like governments have always, you know, had this, you know, need to identify their people, right? Identify their subjects, citizens, what have you. That's not gonna go away. And there's legitimate reasons for government to identify that it's people, right? Um, but the thing about, you know, at least, you know, in my, in my hopeful vision for America's future, right, the government in America is we the people, right, if we don't like something we can vote them out, um, in again, being, you know, hopeful, right, but, but this has always been an experiment that a people can self govern. When we run people out of public office, when we, we, we chase people out of the public sphere, um, and when government is the agency that is doing it, right? So we say government, right? And we forget that there's all kinds of layers from like federal, state, local, county, all of that, right? All of those places have different rules and restrictions on it. I would argue the federal government has some pretty solid restrictions on the data that it can access. Trust me, I've been encountering all of them trying to answer the questions of what's in this data. I haven't been able to get any of it. Right, because they don't they're like, no, we can't collect on US persons. Yay, good. The Church Commission did some value, you know, 40 years ago. Um, that's not to say that there's not risks in this data, and we do need to know what's in it. So if I can't do it in the, as a government entity, then who can? Right. And that's the thing is, is like folks that have ethics look at this and go, 
yeah, I don't think we should be touching that, right? And uh, the companies that, that have no legal restraints on it are going, yeah, let me have more, right? So I do think that it is a complicated problem. We do need to think through this in terms of, you know, regulating from the, the, the most amount of harm and to restrict the most amount of harm. You know, we have rules around credit reporting about what can be put on the credit report and what has to be removed, mm -hmm. right? There's legislation there and there's an agency that's responsible for enforcing that. I know it's not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, yes. but at least in theory, it's a starting point. Great, thank you. So the next question is about, uh, and I'm just gonna leave this here and then add a couple more. What's the role of HIPAA if medical information is widely available is one of the questions. And it's actually, it's a fair question. It's a really you, good question. Yeah. Um, um, actually, so the, yeah. Oh, go ahead. No, no, I, 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 I was gonna say, you can just go through it quickly, but I think it's actually, it's, I think it's actually a great question. So I highly, highly recommend Mary Ebeling's book, After Lives of Data. It came out last year and, you know, I'm not easily horrified in this space anymore. And it was just like the whole book is me just going, you know, exclamation points and wow about the things that I learned in, in that book. Um, and, and essentially what you learn from, from that and looking at HIPAA laws is that HIPAA is only covered entities. So specific hospitals, right? And specific entities that have access to medical data. The minute your data moves out from a covered entity, it is no longer protected. That's the critical piece. So if, for example, you're a researcher and you decide to ask for medical data and you get access to it, you're no longer, you know, the data is no longer in a covered entity in a lot of ways. And I'm going to probably mess up the legal aspects of this because there's a whole lot of law around this. But, you know, that's where a lot of these apps and these mental health apps, et cetera, are getting away with a lot of this is they, they're not bound by this. They are not covered entities. Um, your medication, if you use a rewards card at, at, at CVS, you know, they can sell your medication list, right? Like, you know, the, the, the question of what is a covered entity is actually super, super relevant, which is why we have to stop thinking about, you know, classes of data and entities and start thinking about the data, the data pictures that are built about us more broadly. Hmm. Um, that's a horrifying answer. Yeah, it's not, it's not fun. I'm, I'm really fun at parties. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, this is a, a recurrent theme. Um, so we've got two questions here from Professor Ana de Sosa. Where does the press fit into all of this? Uh, do they also think privacy is dead? And how do you see this discussion relating to the fundamental U.S. emphasis on entrepreneurism, capitalism, e.g. Facebook tweaking, just like cigarette, beverage, and food companies? And, and I'll extend Ana's que uh, answer question. You know, Mark Zuckerberg always goes before Congress and puts on his most sincere face and says, we here at Facebook or Meta or whatever we're calling ourselves now, we believe in the marketplace of ideas and we believe that open debate is the best antiseptic, that good ideas are the best way to combat bad ideas. And I, I just want to like, I don't know. It, it's 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 yeah. revolting to hear because of like then you've got people who are storming the Capitol because they think the election was stolen. Yeah. Um, what what do you think about this? Um, Anna's very provocative question. It's, it's a wonderful question, and you know, Zanik Tufekci has a wonderful series or an article on the Mark Zuckerberg apology tour about he always shows up and gets very humble and contrite about everything, and it's our responsibility. It's my blah blah blah, right? And then he continues to do everything that he's going to continue to do. Um, you know, so this marketplace of ideas thing, I think, is dangerously naive, right? And I'm going to say something that is, you know, potentially controversial or not, but the Nazi ideology was a sticky ideology. It built cohesion. They used fear and they weaponized fear and anger and, and mobilized a, an entire nation to do horrible, horrible things. Fear is a very powerful, cohesive tool. So if you want to compete against fear, right, how do you do that? You have to calm people down and make people not afraid so that rational decision-making can take over again. So this idea about the marketplace of ideas, it's just dangerously naive about how society works and how people work. Um, and and I, I get very frustrated with that because, you know, Bill Burr, I, I love him. He has a skit about, you know, you know, the, the, you know, everyone should be walking around with a thing of chloroform because you can just stop the next Hitler, you know, gas him and that's it and stop him. Because, you know, he, he talks about this guy that goes into Target and starts going on this rant about undocumented people, and blah, blah, blah. And then he's like, you know, and that guy walks out and no one does anything. And then there's a guy in the back that's like, yeah, I kind of like him. And now there's two of them, right? 
that's the problem with this idea, marketplace of ideas, right? Democracy requires that we, we debate with each other, we argue with each other, and there are a lot of things that should rightly be on the table. There are other things that should be beyond the pale of conversation. I always tell my students, we will absolutely debate what are human rights. We will absolutely debate what are these things? What are these things called rights? We will not debate whether black people are entitled to human rights. We will not debate whether whites, you know, that white women are entitled to human rights. We're not gonna debate who, right? We can debate what they are. We're not gonna debate who's entitled to them. Those, those, that is an off the limits conversation. Um, and so that's really the challenge of, of what we're dealing with here is it's a dangerously naive view that like all ideas, that like the good ideas will win. That's simply not true. Um, I'm going to invite you. I'm going to send. A, put a question by um, Don Weissen in here. I'm going to invite you to discuss the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Is it four or five? Four. Um, four. Uh, maybe in response to some of these questions. Um, but Don Weissen and Professor Weissen has a a heartfelt cri de cœur. Um, he says, what level of intervention, state, local, federal, et cetera, are the most realistic opportunities for creating needed regulatory changes around all of this? Uh, he didn't put it this way, but like, oh my God, are there any bright spots? Like, is there anything that can give us hope given how great, you're very you know, upbeat, but what you're saying is horrifying and grim. Yeah. I wanna know what, what, what's encouraging to you in this, in this debate and in this, the dynamics of these questions? You know, I, so I'm gonna to try to find the bright spot, right? I do believe in, in us, right? I think it was Churchill that said, Americans will always do the right thing after they've tried every wrong thing, right? Um, and, and we always take steps backwards um, after taking, you know, you're making progress. So, you know, I, I do think we will, we may be okay in the long run, right? Because, you know, I, I do wanna believe that, you know, people are generally good. Um, and people are generally going to try to, um, you know, do the, the right thing, but those are loaded comments in a lot of ways. Um, I think the more that this stuff impacts, and this is terrible, I'm getting, I just want to fully acknowledge what I'm getting ready to say is terrible, because we should care about this stuff impacting undocumented people and gays and lesbians and trans people, right? We should care about this impacting everybody, right? But the more that this stuff impacts middle class people, the more that this stuff impacts, you know, everyday life is the way that I think we will get movement on this. And again, that is that is I fully acknowledge that is a terrible statement. Um, but the, the, I think that's, you know, where the political power is going to lie is in people pushing back on this that, that have a political voice. Um, and, and we need to start building more coalitions with different groups that are struggling with this with these problems already. Um, but it's it's a long fight because you know it is so entrenched. It's fun, right? Like going on, you know, it's social media stuff. It's it's entertaining. It's fun. I I fully acknowledge. I like Twitter. I have learned a lot from Twitter, right? Before you know, it kind of went sideways, right? Like I I've been able to listen into different conversations and and learn things that I never would have learned before, you know, without being there. I, I appreciate so much. My perspectives have changed so much from that. Um, but it's also very dangerous because you know. He, you know, Musk talks about loving free speech, and then he replatforms Andrew Anglin. Andrew Anglin is the publisher of the Daily Stormer, a literal neo-Nazi website. Sorry, yeah, yeah, maybe he can go off to his own little corner of the internet, and we don't need to deal with him, right? Like that's not free. Okay, great. Nazis get free speech too. Uh... I get it. There should be a public square that has some some norms and and there should be some teeth behind regulations to enforce those norms well I'm, you know i sorry the public square thing is is such an interesting thing right because back in the day every town had their you know their 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 challenged person that was standing on the corner you know screaming about the end times etc and if you got in someone's face you likely got punched right we have a whole generation of folks that have been raised on not not having to deal with you know watch your mouth keep your teeth and, and I'm, not, I'm not saying I'm encouraging violence, but like when there's no consequences for horrible behavior, horrible behavior continues. Yeah. And it doesn't always have to be jail. <laughs> yeah. So I have a, a, a really interesting question here from a high school teacher, and I'm going to loop it back to things you said before. So the question you mentioned generative AI can create well written BS. How do you see large language language models like chat GPT affecting education and academia? I'm a high school teacher and a student told me um, that they had written um, an 
a, they had AI write an essay for him in a class he took. Uh, his, the teacher's worry is that models confidently hallucinate and quotes not only false information, but outright bigoted rhetoric. And of course, there's the issue of these models learning from people's intellectual property without permission. I, I wanted to invite you to talk a little bit more about the concepts of scraping and training data. Um, yeah. Cause I'm not sure everybody knows about that. Like the training, it's the training of the algorithms. Yeah, so one of the problems with the way most of these large language models have been built is they go out and they basically grab all of the content off of the internet, right? And you know, one of the things that we have in the United States is copyright law. The minute you put affix something into a medium, you own the copyright of it on it, right? Well, all of these companies that have been doing these large language models have just been gathering it all up and using it, right? There's probably going to be some legal challenges about that use and that that is that fair use or not, and does that violate copyright, right? But legal processes take a really long time. Um, in the short term, I think the the better way to deal with ChatGPT. So I'm not going to allow it in my classroom. Um, and if I catch students, I, I will put, I will put them in the honor system, right? But where I will try to draw some boundaries of it is, you know, go use a system like Grammarly to help clean up your writing, right? Make sure it's your ideas, but you know, clean it up. Because one of the things that I find with some of my students is they have really good ideas, but they maybe struggle with putting their words together, right? So use it as a tool to help you, you know, strengthen your art, strengthen your writing structure, not your ideas. Um, because yeah, this, so one of the things that's happening in the chat GPT spaces and the generative AI is, is they're trying to make it sound like it's, it's human intelligence, right? So we use the term like hallucinate. It's not hallucinating. There's a really great article. Right? It's, it's, an, it's bullshitting, right? It's just basically making stuff up. It's giving you the next random number that they think is most likely answer, right? That's not hallucinating. That's, that's BSing, right? Um, and, and again, when we really think about the data that's on the internet, like the vast majority of the internet is porn. That's why like most of the generative AI stuff that builds images, you know, when it builds women images, it's very, very sexualized, right? And it doesn't know what a female astronaut is because it doesn't have a lot of training data on that, right? So it recreates and re-entrenches all of the biases that are already out there and it makes it look like oh well look here's this you know magical thing that's going to solve all of our biases when it's really just you know recreating them and amplifying them in a lot of ways so i think in the short term it's going to cause a lot of problems in the classroom um i think we are all going to have to really um you know think through our, our pedagogy and how we're going to teach and how we're going to assess knowledge um, and I, I can easily see a, a space where we go back to, um, you know, multiple choice, you can't use ChatGPT on, um, oral exams, you probably can't use ChatGPT on, right? So I think it's going to make life a little bit, you know, tougher in terms of assessment. Um, and I think, you know, South Park did a great episode on ChatGPT. Actually, if you haven't watched, it's quite good. Um, but, you know, Wendy, the, the little smart girl was like, I write my own papers, I don't understand, right? So it's going to give some people the advantage in the short run. Um, and, you know, we've got to figure out how to weed that out. Or we've got to sit there and really think about, you know, is it okay to use to, you know, have students help, help it turn it into, you know, take their ideas and turn it into something more coherent. I don't know. I haven't really wrestled with where I stand on this stuff. Um, because there was uh, one person, I can't remember who it was, but posted about, you know, imagine you've got a large language model that's used to help people get through Medicaid processes to get through insurance claims, right? So now you've got, you know, all of these insurance claims being filled because, you know, they've got these, they've been able to leverage this technology to help the little guy. I'm like, yeah, okay, I, I can see a need for that. That would be a good thing, right? Um, but like, think about the consequences of that. If individuals can start leveraging it to, you know, quote, beat the man that, that I, I wouldn't have a problem with that, you know, just from an ethical standpoint, but at the same time, right. That's probably not how it's going to be used. Um, so I have a related question. Um, our students are advocate from Professor uh, Botin. Our students are advocating for more higher ed opportunities that are fully online. These programs certainly put their privacy at risk, particularly with online proctoring. How can we think about these compromises? So institutions need to demand that the tech, the tech that they're using doesn't collect the data. If they do, then they refuse to use it, right? I mean, that the institutions have to leverage their institutional power and that it gets stronger when more institutions team up and say, this is the platform we're gonna use because it does not, right? We have to remember that, that institutions matter, right? Where institutions start putting their weight, things change. Um, you know, if we start really implementing, you know, demanding that the tech platforms that we use doesn't collect, right? If we start demanding that, you know, if Google Classroom is going to be used in the classroom, that they have to delete our children's data at the end of every year, 
right? Well, how do we verify that one? But I think that's probably a good place to start. Um, but we have to, you know, institutions and, and agencies that are buying these platforms have to be able to interrogate that and, and look at the risks that, that are involved with these and then find another platform. There is an emerging market for privacy focused solutions. There, there is, right? You've got Signal that is, you know, encrypted by default. Um, you know, Brave browser, like there is an emerging market for this. We have to be willing to support that market. So Sadly, everything's market these days. No, I understand. I understand. Um, so then there's another question here from Marion Engelman. Um, what's your analysis of the current state and federal policy proposals to restrict access to social media for children? Oh, that's a good one. How do you verify that someone's a kid? Do I have to give them my ID card? Like, how do we actually verify that, right? Like in theory, I don't think it's a bad idea, right? In theory, I don't think it's a bad idea. How do you verify that someone's a kid? I think that becomes a much bigger problem because now if the, if the default is we assume everyone is a child and you have to prove that you're an adult, again, how do I prove that I'm an adult? I'm not sending Facebook my driver's license, right? I'm not sending, I'm certainly not sending Pornhub my driver's license so that they can link everything that I, I don't use Pornhub, but I'm just using an example, but like, I'm not going to give them my driver's license so that then they can have a validated list of, you know, stuff that I'm looking at, right? That no. So, you know, this question of, of, of verification, right? again, in theory, I'm not opposed to it. How do you implement it? So the, if imp implementing it would require even further invasions of privacy and turning more of your data over to the yep. people who are then going to sell it. Yep. At least as, as we've conceptualized it right now. Yeah, I, I haven't seen any good ideas on how to actually regulate that. Um, I mean, and I, again, I keep using Pornhub as an example, and I'm sorry for if this is like upsetting, but like Utah like doesn't have access to Pornhub any, anymore, right? Like basically cut off access because they cannot verify people. They have no mechanism to do it, so they're not going to violate the law. So they pulled out. Like again, is that a, is that a net loss for society? Probably not. But you know, are they going to be really, really pissed off users? Yeah. Right. So actually, that was the follow up with Marion's question: the Utah Social Media Regulation Act which is what I'm assuming is at least part of what you're talking about. Yeah, like I said, it's 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 not wrong in spirit, right? Like I, I don't think it's wrong in spirit to say, hey, you know what? Because listen, you know, anybody that's under the age of 25 has had a massive social co experiment conducted on them. Kids have grown up in the last decade with access to incredibly violent, horrific graphic pornography. Right. And incredibly violent, you know, graphic images across the board. We have no idea what this has done to them. We really don't. I have a friend that, you know, his son came to him and said, Dad, I can't get it up because I've watched too much porn. Like, and thank God, you know, he trusted his dad enough to have that conversation with him. But like, that is like a super awkward conversation that no kid ever wants to have with their parent. So where do they go to look that up and try to get help? They go to the internet. Where does the internet take them? It is a straight line from, you know, no nut November, don't whack off for a month to like, you know, Proud Boys and Nazi content, the Jews control Hollywood. So like, it is an incredibly mm -hmm. dangerous problem that we've got. And we have no idea what this has done to kids. We have no idea what this has done to their brains, et cetera. Um, and that I think is a huge concern. So I don't think these ideas of restricting this is misguided. I just don't know how we implement it in a way that actually protects the people that we want to protect. Hmm. Like I said, I am super fun at parties. <laughs> Small talk uh, is, is your forte. I can, I can, uh, I can appreciate it. Um, so someone else asked, doesn't the NSA collect data on us? So I can't speak to this in any knowledge other than what's in the public sphere because I simply don't know. Um, but I do know that, you know, if there is data collection that is going on, it does require warrants to be looked at, et cetera, right? It's not just like anybody can go log into your stuff and check it out. Now, at Facebook, anybody can go log into your stuff and check it out, right? Um, I, I can't speak to, you know, I know that there was some really good reporting on this um, at PBS Frontline and several folks, folks resigned out of the Bush, Bush uh, 45, 43, whatever. Um, the second Bush uh, administration because they felt that the, the, um, the, the tracking or the surveillance there was too much and it was violation of civil liberties. Um, so yes, I do think the NSA has the ability to do this again, just looking at open source information, but I also think that there's rules and limits on what they're allowed to do. There's lots of lawyers that are gonna put checks and balances on that. Is that perfect? Is that reassuring? 
I, I can't speak to whether or not that's going to reassure folks. Um, for me, I do find that somewhat reassuring that it's not just any dude behind a computer that can go dig into your stuff. Um, good. Um, so I have a question about, so you remember the, um, the New York Times article about the reporter that had the first um, conversations with the chat GPT or, or no, maybe it was the other one where the, it said, you don't love your wife, you love me. And like, it, it sounded like Hal who had like from 2001, yeah. it was really a horrifying conversation. Now you've talked, and so I, the question is, you said it's this AI right now is algorithmic bullshit. It's not sentient, right? It's not hallucinating. Um, how worried should we be uh, about sentience? Because if these things are learning, at what point do they, and I'm not saying sentient like they think like people, but at what point sentient like they have an awareness of themselves separate from the people who create the program and have a desire to perpetuate themselves? Not that they pass the Turing test necessarily, but that they, they're like, oh, you, you know, like the whole thing with, uh, there's a Keanu Reeves movie a few years ago. It wasn't the one where he's the John Wick thing where he says 368 words and then kills like 100 million people. It was a, he was an alien who came in who was going to he was there to destroy the earth because so that it could restart again. Right. Because it, we had done such a horrible job with it. At what point is there a risk of this, of AI becoming sentient and turning against us? I mean, I think so, but that's just because if it's built by us and that's what we do to each other, so why wouldn't we build something that's going to do that to us? Um, but I think it, it's a it's a more deep sociological question in a lot of ways of what is consciousness? What is what does it mean to be human, right? You know, and I think you know the sociologists in us would 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 talk about interaction and connection, and we develop our sense of selves from our connection with others. These computer systems don't have a meaningful connection with others. They're not going to get that interaction in a lot of ways. Um, so I, I think it's a really, really good question. Um, you know, I'm very worried about where this is going. I, I absolutely am, right? I mean, anybody that's watched the Terminator movies or, or any of those things, right, is, or even watching WALL-E, right? The computer decides to take over and keep everybody from going back to Earth. Um, you know, I do think that, you know, having a manual override is really, really important. Um, and I do worry about it. I worry about it a lot. I think, you know, you can see where people will develop relationships with these things and it's not a thing that, and, and, you know, what is it going to tell them to do, right? That is a really good question. So I very much worry about this. Um, but I don't think we have a good answer. Like we don't even really understand consciousness, I don't think. So we're going to have a hard time knowing when these systems have crossed that threshold. Um, but I think there's, there's enough people that are, you know, experts in the field that are warning us of like, we need to slow down a lot of this and unpack what's going on and understand why the decisions are being, you know, that the systems are coming up with what they're doing. There's no other system in the world that we would put out there and say, well, we don't really know how it works, but trust us. Like, that's not a thing, um, or at least it's not a long-term thing. So I, I think this is going to have to get reined in. Um, and I think that the states that are willing to, you know, proceed and not rein it in, put us all at risk. Um, well, we're at 7.30, um, which is the official end time. Do you have any final parting comments you'd like to make? Um, I mean, I, I know it's very dark and dystopian. And like I said, I'm, I'm really, really fun at parties. Um, but I do, I do have faith in us, right? Um, you know, America is a grand social experiment. And we take people from all over the world. And you, you take an oath to, to this nation. And, you know, that means that we're going to we're going to figure this out. Right. I, I do believe we will figure this out. Um, I'm not willing to give up hope yet and, and you know, go back to the canned goods and shotguns. But um, it's going to be a lot of pain and a lot of work in, in the short term. And, and we have to, you know, build communities to to coalesce around supporting each other. Um, we have to push back on this. There has to be a critical mass of people that are willing to say, I am not going to use this because um you know and and not be looked at like you're you're some crazy opt-out person right um we have to normalize you know protecting privacy and all of that and it's going to require all of us that are you, you know going to work on this in different angles and I, I would also say that you know as i mentioned this impacts all of our fields there's data out there for everyone of everyone that's at this talk there's data out there for you to tackle and interrogate and and uncover right and if you're a qualitative person don't be afraid of this um, trust me, I'm, I'm afraid of this. I have crayons on my wall from stats class, 
but you know, understanding what goes into this and 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 t- teaming up with someone else to help interrogate this stuff, your your, your perspectives are absolutely necessary. Um, I do believe that this is the civil rights fight of our time. Um, that if we don't get a handle on this and rein in how these systems can be used, it is going to be used to you know benefit a very very few m- m- number of people, and the rest of us are going to be you know left to suffer behind the consequences. Um, but I do have faith in us, right? I, I do have faith that people can be rallied to the to, to the side of, of good and the side of 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 you know that that we do believe that you know that 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 you know better days are coming. So um, that's great. Thank you. Um, I'll follow up with you. There are a bunch of people who want to read something you've written, um, and we can we can send out an email. I think to the people who had registered for the talk. Um, so please, everybody, um, thank you. Join me in thanking Professor, uh, uh, Major Professor Dawson, uh, Jessica Dawson from West Point from the Army Cyber Institute. The claps and applause on on Zoom are really not the same as in person, but you can see people <laughs> moving their hands. So, I'm just grateful there were a lot of questions. So thank you for that. <laughs> yeah, and I had I summarized several of them actually to sort of get you through. So thank you. This was really um, a thought-provoking talk. And thank you, everyone, for the questions. Thank you to the Engelmans for sponsoring this. Thank you for to uh, Diana uh, Lazov, who organizes this so ably. And thank you, Dean Ryan, for, um, for being here. And uh, it's very nice just to host you. And uh, I hope we get a chance to chat again soon. Yes, we, we need to co-author something together. That would be fun. <laughs> I, I would like that. All right. Thank you, everyone.